Okay, good. <laughs> thankful very, hi mom. Um, <laughs> thankful very much that uh, the more miracle of Facebook brought me together with uh, Nick and Caitlin at a rather ill-fated uh, theology on tap one time. That was interesting. But uh, as time has gone on, I really learned to enjoy the uh, the young adult group here and uh, all the wonderful personalities that I've had the chance to interact with. Well, I tonight, uh, although I will have to make a disclaimer, I am a career English major, and yet I'm talking about science. But I have written uh, a few science fiction novels, so in some people's minds that qualifies me to speak on the topic. So I'm happy about that. But my topic tonight is Science and the Church Together They Stand. I like to start off every... Uh, and uh, by the way, I, I tell people this too, if I get too boring or if, I, if I'm on something too long, just wave or do some kind of a sign at me, I'm good with that. But I like to start off every uh, lecture with a short little anecdote. And the first one I do want to talk about tonight is when I was a very little boy. Um, I don't know if this will resonate with anybody, but when I was, I guess, about six years old, I realized that girls were extremely annoying creatures. They were the devil. and. <laughs> their primary purpose was to bother me and just tell on me to the teachers. And I remember still feeling that way when I was 10 years old, I am never getting married. Don't know about the priest thing, but I am never getting married. Girls are so annoying. I absolutely despise them. They were the enemy. And then uh, by the time I was 12, and I noticed that Linda Kremick was looking different <laughs> in my seventh grade class. Yeah, exactly. Um, and by the time I was 13, 14, well, you know, we all know where, those, where your head goes in those kinds of situations. But by the time I was a teenager, obviously I was looking very differently at the girls. And there was something else on my mind, and definitely it was not that they are the enemy. And it wasn't until really though I was married for a while and I really appreciated my wife's way of approaching problems that I realized men and women are different. They're obviously different physically. And they are different mentally. They approach problems. I love the video that Nick sent a while ago about the girl with the nail in her head. I showed that one at a staff meeting one time, and uh, all the ladies were cracking up. You know, I don't know if you've seen it, but a girl has a nail in her head, and she wants to talk about how it makes her feel. And her husband keeps on trying to reach. Maybe if I pulled it out, stop trying to fix that. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> but. I realized uh, once I'd been married for a while, I really got to appreciate my wife's way of problem solving. Although they are different mentally, physically, spiritually, that does not automatically make them each other's enemy. So the differences between men and women physically allow them to rain new life into the world. Uh, the differences mentally, although at the middle school level, I joke and I say it's why girls cannot go to the bathroom together and come back in under 20 minutes. It's why guys cannot play Call of Duty, you know, for, for just five minutes. They have to be there for eight hours if you let them. Uh, it's a game where you kill things. But <laughs> men and women are designed to do things differently. Men are designed to solve problems. Women are designed to make connections. And uh, sometimes the problems are solved by, you know, making those emotional connections. And sometimes the problems are solved by hitting them with a rock enough times that they lie down and they don't move anymore. But that's how guys and women approach problems differently, and each one is valuable, I've realized, as time has gone on. Yet, it seems like a false, di it is a false dichotomy to say that men and women, because they are different, are automatically at odds. But we see people doing the same thing with science and the Catholic Church today. So, starting off, what a false dichotomy is, as far as a logical fallacy, it's kind of where you build up almost a straw man that's easy to knock down, and the other option, which is your own, is much more, uh, is considered a lot more viable. We must have either s rational science or superstitious Catholicism. For a lot of folks, and, and I know as a published science fiction author, I've met a number of folks who have this basic worldview that the church is the enemy of science and the church has to lose or else things are going to go very, very bad. They won't ex explain specifically how things will go very, very bad except some vaporous idea that maybe people will be burned at the stake or something like that. But it's also like saying, either I keep smoking or I'll get fat. So since I don't want to get fat, I've got to keep smoking. Well, obviously, just because you quit smoking does not automatically mean you're going to get fat. Just because we don't reject the church does not automatically mean that people are going to get burned at the stake. But you do have a number of people who do have this false idea that the church and science are at odds with each other. So tonight I'm going to look a little bit at the roots of this dichotomy. What I'd like to do is, since I regularly have these kinds of arguments with individuals, I like to look at the two or three biggest ones that people have against the church involving itself in science. 
And then I'm going to be looking at, you've got a number of examples on your handouts, of ways in which the church has actually been the friend of science, and what the church has actually said, uh, not just through the catechism, that's their ad nauseum, but through our, uh, our late uh, pontiff, uh, blessed John Paul II, what he had to say in one of his encyclicals, Fides et Ratio, which means uh, faith and reason. They're seen as two pillars holding up a house, rather than two enemies fighting one another. Am I making sense? Am I going too fast? Am I yapping too much? Okay, great. Okay, well the objection, what exactly is science? Well, the World Dictionary says, science is the systematic study of the nature and behavior of the material and physical universe. So that's important, the material and the physical universe. It's based on observation, experiment, and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe these facts in general terms. So the first objection you often hear to the church and science working and, and coexisting and actually strengthening each other is that there is no scientific evidence for God. Therefore, the new atheists especially, like Richard Dawkins like to say, therefore religion in general and the church in particular is a false pipe dream. He refers to God as the sky fairy in an effort, in an effort to kind of make the church look and make God, the idea of God in general, and the church in particular look ridiculous. But when you say that there is no scientific evidence for God, well, science by definition measures the material world. Now, there's a problem, obviously, if you're trying to measure the material world, uh, you're trying to use material world measurements for something that is supernatural, something that is above the actual natural world. What is faith? Now, we looked at what is science, Well, what is faith? When I ask my students that, my students will often say, faith is believing in something and reason tells you not to. And that's not accurate at all. Believing in something with no evidence is stupidity. Believing in something with some evidence is faith. So for example, I can believe in Australia, even though I've never been there. And uh, has everyone here ever been to New York? Who has never been to New York? Okay. Yet you can believe in New York. Why is that? It's part of this, one of the 50 states. It's one of the 50 states. I always think of New York City, but you get the idea. We've all seen pictures, we know people who've experienced it and so forth. So you have some evidence that's there. You can have a reasonable amount of faith that a place like New York City exists. So I don't have any faith, however, in this flying spaghetti monster. And the flying spaghetti monster, for those who haven't had to deal with the new atheists, well, if you have faith, in, so you have faith in Jesus. If I have faith in the flying spaghetti monster, does that mean the flying spaghetti monster exists? No. We have faith in Christ because there's a lot of other evidences for Christ. We don't have faith in the flying spaghetti monster because there's no evidence there. Now, as for scientific evidence, when someone says, show me scientific evidence that God exists and I'll believe in him, well, that sets up another false dichotomy. <clears throat> the best example I have of this is uh, one I heard of. If you have somebody who is, won't open their eyes, and hypothetically they've never opened their eyes in their life, but they say, I won't believe in the color red unless you can make it produce the right sound. Make reds, make the sound of red, and I'll believe in it. <laughs> Just open your eyes. No. no, 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 no. You've got to make the sound of red, and then I'll believe in it. It doesn't make red any less real, but you can't, red doesn't have a sound. Now, you do have folks who have synthasia where they'll hear a sound and it makes colors appear in their eyes. I'm sure somebody has seen that 2020 episode. But the point is, the color is triggered by a sound. Okay? There are sounds that might make us think of colors, but they are simply two different mediums. Okay? Science deals with the material world. Faith, or God, deals with things that are above the material world, or simply not a material sense. The interesting thing that I've found is if you're dealing with atheism today, uh, there is a real strong movement to say we can be moral, we can be interested in social justice without God. That's a separate issue that I don't really want to tackle tonight. But how do you measure justice? You can't measure justice with a yardstick. You can't scientifically measure love with anything else. You can see evidences of it, but you can't actually measure them. And yet, nobody denies that they exist. So the most important things in life simply are not measurable by science either. Yet, even the most hardcore atheists will admit to their existence. So, make sense so far? Okay, cool. <clears throat> well, let's see, what's my next point? We know that these are real things even though we cannot measure it. So, the simple answer is science tells us about the material world. It tells us what we, what is there and what we can do. But the church as God's guide, the church that Christ left on earth, tells us what we ought to do with that knowledge. 
So that is essentially the church's, uh, how the church works with science. One of the more common objections you hear about the church being a friend to science. Anybody toss one out here? Not off hand? Okay. The one that I hear the most uh, when I deal with uh, either college students or late high school students, people usually mention one of two things, the Spanish Inquisition or Galileo. Could I get a quick bit of feedback from folks on what they believe Galileo was and about the whole Galileo situation was in about two sentences? No fair if you've read Catholic.com and all the apologetic stuff. So I'm not going to go to Nick at all. <laughs> Nobody remembers this at all? Nobody had a science teacher throw this out in school? Something to do with astronomy and like the universe like revolved around the Earth, or I mean like the solar system around the Earth. Correct. See, back then, uh, back, this is uh, in the days when the uh, so-called Reformation was starting to get in full swing. A lot of the astronomers of the day believed in the uh, Ptolemaic form of the universe. It's, I, I keep on wanting to pronounce it Ptolemy, for those of you who've seen it, it's got this little silent P in the front. The Ptolemaic view of the universe said that the Earth was the center of the universe, and science, and they could measure and prove this, said that the stars were on about 23 invisible transparent spheres that moved around the Earth in various speeds. Okay. Science back then. Well, a Catholic priest named Copernicus, how many people have heard the name Copernicus before? How many people knew he was a Catholic priest? Okay. That tends to get edited out of our modern textbooks. A Catholic priest named Copernicus thought that 23 spheres was an ugly thing for God to make. Some folks thought it was as high as 64. So he made up a new system that posited that possibly the sun was at the center of the universe and there were only 16 spheres. Okay. A lot nicer, a lot more clean, a lot, uh, lot to work with. Galileo liked that idea. And essentially through measurement, he claimed to have proven that, in fact, scientifically demonstrated and daringly showed that the sun was actually the center of the universe. Can anybody see the problem with this? If God loves us, why isn't the earth at the center? Well, some folks had a problem with that, exactly. You know, there's also a bit where the sun stopped moving for Joshua, and there was one line in one psalm, okay, the precursors of fundamentalists, where it says the earth is fixed so that it cannot be moved. Okay. Now, the problem is this, and usually my middle school students uh, can figure this part out. This model of the universe was just as wrong as Ptolemy's in the other direction. Instead of the sun being the center of all things, instead of the earth being the center of all things and not moving, he's got the sun doing this instead. So you could argue it's still just as wrong. But uh, he didn't so much discover that the earth revolved around the sun, he was attempting to prove Copernicus's theories correct. Now, most folks don't know, the Pope at the time, a gentleman by the name of Leo X, he actually found this idea intriguing. He wanted to learn more about Copernicus's theories. For the most part, the church raised no objections to the Copernican view of the universe with the sun, so long as it was presented as a theory and not a fact. Uh, most important, that theory at the time could not be proven by then current scientific technology. Another thing that tends to get left out of this bit is that Galileo was a believing Catholic. His daughter became a nun. So he didn't have problems with the church. He was friends with Leo X at the time. Why did Galileo get in trouble? First, he started to insist that this theory was a fact. Mm -hmm. Galileo's biggest trouble in his day came not from the church. It came from fellow astronomers who really, really did not like him, who thought he was being unscientific and started to trash his theories. Another fact that's often left out is that Jesuit astronomers had found out the same, drawn the same conclusions. Where the Jesuit astronomers were differing from, were differing from Galileo at the time, though, was that Galileo was bringing things into a theological arena. He was attacking scripture, not science. So he wasn't trying to be a scientific martyr. He was bringing things to a level that involved attacking scripture. To understand why the church had a problem with this, you had the um, Protestant Reformation going full swing. People would take one Bible verse and start a whole new sect of Protestantism from it. And back then, the church hadn't really asked the question, could a heretic necessarily go to heaven? You know, would, could, what was invincible ignorance? 
Somebody who led people into heresy was considered worse than a spy. We execute spies because they end up putting people's lives at risk. A heretic was worse because you put somebody's eternal soul at risk. Does that make sense? So we're seeing more about the culture of the day than the actual nature of the church when we look at the Galileo um, controversy. Uh, secondly, Galileo's writings were very popular. The church had to step in and make a statement about it. Also, and again, instead of staying in the scientific sphere, a lot of people get mad saying, well, religion is intruding on science. Well, Galileo, his science, he tried to intrude into religion. Okay. He could have avoided trouble if he had simply presented his work the way Copernicus had as a theory and stuck to science rather than making the whole thing a great big theological dispute over the meaning of scripture. So, whereas, again, this was not a case of religion invading science, it was the other way around. It was a fellow using science to start disputing religion. The trial of Galileo, the actual trial that they had, it's often presented in terms that are simply inaccurate. Um, it's presented as if Galileo is arguing that science is supreme over faith, and that these big bad tribunal judges demanded that he submit science into a uh, lower level of, than faith. In reality, the Gal Galileo and the tribunal judges both believed science and the Bible could not stand in contradiction. They did not contradict one another. So I already mentioned the Jesuit astronomers. They were working hard to present it in a way that would not be in danger of leading people into heresy these other astronomers who have found the same Copernican model with the uh, sun, that the earth moved around the sun was what they actually proved, but they were basically trying to work that in a way that would not be considered a danger of heresy to anybody, that did not attack scripture, that would in fact coincide. Again, mistakes came from Galileo's personality and style. He was combative, he almost insisted on being some kind of a martyr type. Uh, the Holy Father at the time, when he became uh, the Holy Father at the time was a friend of Galileo's. Galileo thought, since this guy is my buddy, I will be essentially bulletproof if I present my theories as fact. Not so. You had jealous competitive scientists who were out to get him, and tribunal judges who erroneously believed that it was scientific fact that the universe removed around, moved around a motionless Earth. So, because of the Galileo trial, Galileo probably did not actually say it still moves at the end of his, when he had to recant his theories. He was never tortured, never threatened with torture, okay, necessarily. Um, when Galileo, Galileo did die in 1642, the church never infallibly declared his works to be erroneous. It was just the finding that they might be heretical, that they might lead people to go the wrong direction. That was the only finding the church tribunals ever had. No pope ever spoke uh, on it infallibly. So, just because we did find out that yes, indeed, the earth does go around the sun does not make the church bogus, is what I'm trying to say. That, in fact, it was the way Galileo was presenting things that was more attacked than his actual findings. Um, again, those of you who have been in a relationship at some point or another, or maybe even with siblings, you know that the way you say something can be far more important than what you actually say. So I go through this with my seven children all the time. <laughs> poke, 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 verbally until they know just what to say to make the sibling explode. Mom or dad comes, all I said was, <laughs> okay. We can apply that with Galileo. It wasn't so much his findings per se, but the way that he insisted on presenting them that was seen as this is a danger to the souls of others, that this could lead people into further heresy, not believing the Bible and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay. Sorry, it's the middle school teacher in me. My wife hates it when I say that. It's just, okay. Now, interestingly enough, it wasn't just in 1992, that in 1992 when I graduated from college, all the news outlets were saying, ah, oh, the church admits it's wrong, finally, about Galileo. No. Less than 100 years after Galileo's death, uh, Pope Benedict XV granted an imprimatur to the first edition of the complete works of Galileo. So the church recognized Galileo's works were free of doctrinal error at that point. Uh, the Codex of Forbidden Books in 15, 1757 
uh, allowed works that supported the Copernican theory, okay, which said that basically uh, science had reached the point where the theory could be proven. So essentially that book, anything that had the Copernican theory was removed from the index of forbidden books. Um, I'm not going to go into all the forbidden books bits and so forth. You see a lot of that and how to work with that on Catholic.com. But the point is, the church did not wait until 1992 to say Galileo was right. The church was basically saying this is free of doctrinal error long, long, long before that. So, the next argument you sometimes will have against science versus uh, the Catholic Church. I am going to focus specifically on the Catholic Church and not religion in general, because I can't speak for every Protestant sect that's out there. There's three to five new ones sprouting up in this country every week, uh, along with all the other faiths. But specifically with the Catholic faith, the argument that I have heard from some of my students, very simplistic, but a lot of the ones you hear are along the lines of science helps people, religion hurts people. And there's no religion that's nastier than the Catholic religion. They're the ones that everybody agrees are the bad guys. Okay, well, maybe it's the robes, maybe it's the hats, maybe it's the staffs, I don't know. But there's this odd, you know, tenseness you'll see in some people, especially the ones who consider themselves scientific types, who get upset when the Catholic Church is mentioned. My kids absolutely love, this is my little wandering down memory lane, if you've ever seen the movie Nacho Libre? Yep. No? Great movie in a lot of ways, although you really have to understand, you have, probably have to like Napoleon Dynamite. It's funny, it's the most accurate film about Catholicism in many ways, uh, and it was made by a couple of Mormons, which is even funnier to me. <laughs> but one of the characters is a homeless guy named Stephen, and the main character is a priest named Jack, played by Jack Black, who likes the orphans, and he wrestles to save the orphans kind of a thing. He becomes a luchador, a Mexican wrestler. But Stephen, the homeless man, will keep on saying, I believe in science. I'm not going to pray. And my daughter, God bless her, was the one who piped up and said, well, what did science do for him? Thank you. And that's the idea. <laughs> Thank you. He's homeless. Okay. But science hurts people. Science helps people. Religion hurts people. This is the general idea you'll see. Well, take a look at the Spanish Inquisition. This is one that's often brought up. The idea, my best friend from high school threw this at me, who is Jewish, and you know, he threw this at me this week. 5,000 people died in just one year from the Spanish Inquisition. No, no, they didn't. Uh, a non-Catholic writer named Vox Day uh, noted that, in actuality, there were four Spanish Inquisitions. They were not done to try and bash scientists or free thinkers or anybody of other religions into being Catholic, or they tortured them and burned them at the stake. In fact, the Inquisition was an inquiry group. Primarily its job uh, was to investigate people who claimed they had converted to Catholicism, but did not actually do so. This was done because at, the, at one point during a, a period of Muslim <coughs> aggression, when the, they were practically knocking on Spain's door after taking over most of North Africa, uh, Queen Isabella wanted to find out if those who were in her empire and yes, she did mention Jews. Okay. You could argue that's a case of anti-Semitism. We weren't in part of that culture at the time. But were they actually Catholic and therefore loyal to the crown? Or was there a danger in them being turncoats? So the Inquisition actually only sentenced to death less than three people per year out of over 40,000 people who were brought to trial for questionable statements, heresies, and so forth. Okay. Um, I have the excerpt from Box Day and the handouts I gave if you want to take a look at that. Now, if we compare the Spanish Inquisition, this is usually the heavy hitter that people bring up, the evil Spanish Inquisition that the Catholic Church did. If we compare this to the Enlightenment, which is generally considered a time when people began to trust science over faith. Well, in the Enlightenment, just during the reign of terror, and part of the French Revolution that lasted less than a year, you had a total of about 40,000 people in France executed. Either summary execution or guillotined. Among the last was a 14-year-old nun. Okay. Now the Enlightenment, and you have a very uh, compelling argument here by uh, political science Alan Hertzke and a Catholic British historian named Paul Johnson, who argued that one of the big fruits of the Enlightenment, which some Catholic scholars had called the Endarkment, the Enlightenment ended up removing religious faith as a force among the intelligentsia of most European nations. This ended up spreading, and as a result, you ended up having... Um, it paved the way, to make a long story short, for a lot of totalitarian regimes, be they communist, socialist, and so forth. If you look, for example, at Russia under Stalin, 
comparatively shorter period of time, uh, hundreds of years uh, when we're talking about the Spanish Inquisitions, the four Spanish Inquisitions that took place. If we're talking about a comparatively much shorter period of time during the Russian Revolution, the Stalin era, you had, depending on which scholar you talk to, between 8 and 60 million people who die in Russia under an atheistic regime. 30 million during the Chinese Great Leap Forward. Cambodia and some of the smaller Asian nations uh, end up massacring a third of their populations, all in the name of progress. And if you want to, again, see what can science can do when faith is removed from it. Most of us, how many people here have ever heard of the eugenics movement? Okay, what was the eugenics movement? Teacher in me again. Anybody know offhand? Anyone? Anyone? Sterilizing people who had undesirable traits so they couldn't breed. Right. You essentially wanted Margaret Sanger, the founder, foundress of Planned Parenthood, wanted to make what she called a race of thoroughbreds. And as a result, uh, that was one of the things that was done right in this state. I think the last sterilization was, uh, non-voluntary sterilization took place in this state in 1981. The lady is still alive. She was recompensed you know, by John Kitzhaber, which was a good thing he did. But uh, eugenics essentially means good births, and they want the eugenicists, and this was believed by not just Nazi Germany, Americans here right in the state of Oregon were given <coughs> blue ribbons to superior families people who were intelligent and physically able. So the eugenics movement, pure science, divorced from any religious thought, let's make the best people and get rid of the undesirable people. So G.K. Chesterton, to his credit, we'll look at him later on, uh, was the only Catholic author uh, from, the, from Britain, was the only person in the World War I era who actually saw where the eugenics movement was likely going to lead, and he actually predicted the Germans are the ones who are going to take this to its logical conclusion, because they're very efficient and they're very driven. And he was the only member of the intelligentsia who opposed this. Well, again, pure science, devoted from any of religious faith, brought about the deaths of 12 million people, depending on how you count, during the Nazi Holocaust. And we don't even need to look at World War II, necessarily. Okay? So. Another common thing that you hear is that, uh, again, because the church is against science, it's against equality between the genders. I mentioned the boys and girls thing earlier. Um, when you hear rationalistic, atheistic science supposedly frees women, professionally and sexually, who have been oppressed by dogmatic, repressive, patriarchal systems of superstition. And I pulled that from the Humanist Manifesto. Okay? Signed by secular saints, uh, as I call them, like Isaac Asimov and a few other folks. Well, again, I can't speak for the other faiths, but when I say to my, well, I did have one person put their hand up in religion class just at the beginning of the year. Why does the Catholic Church hate women? Was oh, this year? <laughs> no, no, this is a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, but uh, this young man, I, he, you know, you have folks. I call them funky bombs. They try to throw something in just to see what they <laughs> blow up. I said, really, really. And I pointed to the statue of Mary. In the Catholic faith, and again, I can't speak for other religious faiths necessarily, but I know in the Catholic faith. The most honored human in all of history is Mary, a woman. Half of all the Catholic saints are women. You don't see that in other faiths. I mean, if okay, you're, there are 330 million gods in Hindu, so there's probably there are a few females in there, yes, but I doubt it's a 50-50 split the way you see in the Catholic faith. Um, again, to say that uh, the Catholic Church is opposed to human sexuality, well, again, that's not true. If you look at the Song of Solomon, it celebrates eros between a bride and a bridegroom. And C.S. Lewis, a Protestant of all people, did ask, are we really better off with the sexual revolution? Okay. The Catholic Church, the idea that closely linked with a lot of the atheistic views is this notion that human sexuality has to run rampant before we can actually achieve freedom, and it's that bad, nasty Catholic Church that keeps getting in the way. But we can ask what has happened as a result of the sexual revolution, where people tried to remove that uh, and replace it with an atheistic uh, dialectic. Well, we have had skyrocketing teen pregnancy rates, broken homes. My generation, which they don't call us Generation X too much anymore, but I guess that's a good thing. I don't have my goatee now, so. But <laughs> remember goatees? Yeah, OK. They don't say, they're not around very much. Generation X, we were the most victimized by divorce and by abortion. Uh, my, my generation was the most aborted in North American history. General moral decline, 
use of population control worldwide as a form of power over people by unscrupulous governments. It's led to a loss of respect for women. Recent article in Slate magazine, which if you guys want to jot that down for those of you who read Slate online, uh, one of the dirty little secrets of the skeptic movement, highly scientific supposedly, but women have been routinely abused at skeptic uh, conventions and so forth to a huge percentage. Okay? You know, there's, there's a, it's based, just read it and you'll see, I don't want to go into it, I'll be here all night. But all of these were predicted. For those who say the church is lousy at predicting stuff, that the church is lousy at science, all of these things that have come to pass ever since the invention of the birth control pill in the 1950s, these were predicted by Pope Paul VI in his uh, encyclical. Does everyone here know what an encyclical is, by the way? Does anyone not know what an encyclical is? Okay, good. In his encyclical, Humanae Vitae, he predicted all of these things would happen. Because when we look at human sexuality as to be divorced, only the pleasurable aspect taken away from its physical aspect, we begin to see other human beings as problems to be solved rather than celebrated. So we instead, now that we have taken that kind of enlightenment that we get from Christ's church and Christ's understanding of what a human person is, we end up seeing other people as problems. And we end up with things like the eugenics movement and so forth. Well, how has the church actually been the enemy of science? Well, if you look at medical science, my students are always surprised when I tell them, who has ever been to the hospital? Well, thank the Catholic Church, the idea that there's one place where you can bring all the sick people to and they're going to get helped out by a doctor there. You can thank the Catholic faith for that. Um, how many have been helped or saved because of the church's directive? Help the sick, straight out of Matthew. Astronomy. Well, again, Copernicus, as most of you didn't know, was a Catholic priest. And speaking of another Catholic priest, one of the evidences for God that I bring up with my students all the time was St. Thomas Aquinas, Catholic priest. In the medieval era, he came up with the idea of a prime mover. Things naturally want to stop moving, but yet they're always moving. Something had to start things moving at the beginning. He called this the prime mover concept. He had a rudimentary idea of the Big Bang back before telescopes could look much further than your local mountaintop. So he essentially conceived of this and the actual idea of the Big Bang, the, the notion that 13 something billion years ago the universe was started by an explosion, that did, Einstein did not come up with that. That was actually developed by Father George Lemaitre, a brilliant physicist, and when he presented his findings to Einstein, he didn't believe him at first. The math is solid, but I just don't believe it. Well, as time went on, make a long story short, uh, he was proven correct. If we're talking about chemistry, Louis Pasteur, how many people here drank milk today? We go through about eight gallons a week in my house. It's kind of scary, but uh, pasteurization of milk, obviously. Founder, founder of physiochemistry, father of bacteriology, inventor of biotherapeutics, best known for the vaccine against rabies. No one likes getting a shot, but at least, you know, we don't see too many dogs with foaming mouths these days. <coughs> Famous quote of his, the more I know, the more nearly is my faith that of a Breton peasant. Everyone knows what Breton is? Nope. Region of North, northern France, basically. Uh, a very agricultural region. Could I but know all I would have the faith of a Bre uh, Could I but know all I would have the faith of a Breton peasant woman? And what he could not, above all, understand is the faith of is the failure of scientists to recognize the demonstration of the existence of the Creator that there is in the world around us. Pasteur died with his rosary in his hand, listening to the life of Saint Vincent de Paul, which he had asked to have read to him. Because he, he, thought of that, he thought that his work was like that of St. Vincent. It would do much to save suffering children. You can look at that in the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia. There is a popular anecdote. I could not check and verify it, but for many years there's been an anecdote that's been circulating even in the pre-internet days that uh, Pasteur sat down in a train. You, you heard this one, Aaron? Or I'd say you're nodding your head. Uh, Pasteur, I know. Okay. Pasteur. Pasteur sat down on a train and just started saying his rosary, and this young man says to him, you know, science has proved that's a lot of bunk. Science? Really? Really? I haven't heard about this. Oh, yes, yes. And this young man starts to go through all these lengths about how science has proven that praying to the saints is ridiculous and God in general is ridiculous. If you like, I'll send you some material on this. 
Can I have your address? Certainly. He hands the young man his card, Louis Pasteur. Mm -hmm. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another person, and when I was looking through my children's textbooks, they went to, a, up until very recently, they went to a very conservative school in Battleground called uh, Battleground Cam, but their textbooks did not note that the father of modern genetics was a monk messing around with his pea plants. He's always called Gregor Mendel, but they never call him Brother Gregor Mendel. Okay. Um, he figured out the idea, they had do, been doing animal husbandry for thousands of years, but he actually figured out uh, the concept of dominant and recessive genes. So father of modern, modern genetics. How much good has been done knowing the cause and treatment of gene therapy and other discoveries? Caitlin and I were talking about this a little bit tonight. Um, we're, uh, apparently you guys were going to get a DNA test or something like that to find out uh, the allergies that you have. Uh, in order to find out how the, the likelihood of my kids having mm -hmm. um, that we would both have to go in for some DNA tests. Okay. Which is pointless, but because okay. I already have it, so. There you go. <laughs> Uh, biology. Now, I just found this out today because for those of you who don't know what uh, abiogenesis was, science changes what it believes a heck of a lot faster and a lot more often than religion does. Remember, just 300 years ago, people thought the stars were stuck on these transparent spheres above us. Uh, a little over, t about uh, 250 to 300 years ago, all the good and right-thinking scientists believed that maggots, flies, were just born spontaneously out of rotting meat or that eels and toads sprang out of the mud at the bottom of ponds. There was a scientist named Dr. Needham, or excuse me, he wasn't a doctor, I forget his first name, but he claimed to have proved this theory by taking a dirty shirt and putting it in a bucket of grain and shoving the bucket into a corner in his barn, and 21 days later, mice were produced. Proof. Well, a gentleman named Spallanzani, who again, they don't mention he was a Catholic priest, <laughs> proved this to be wrong. He actually ended up putting gauze over a bunch, it sounds very basic to us today, but he put gauze over a bunch of jars that had rotting meat in them. And he noted that the, with the, when he had gauze on top, all of these maggots would start being born on the gauze, not springing out of the meat. So. This is why when I have somebody try to tell me, well, we actually just kind of sprang out of the mud, or this is where complex life forms just kind of began. Really? So you believe in spontaneous generation? I thought Spallanzani proved that, Father Spallanzani, I'm going to say from now on, Father Spallanzani proved that idea wrong roughly 300 years ago. The idea that only life can come from living matter. So... Computer science. The first woman in America to get a PhD in computer science was a Catholic nun. How many of us used BASIC? You're, you're a software engineer, Greg. I don't touch that. Do you, did you ever <laughs> learn BASIC though? Never? Uh, no. Oh, okay. When I was a kid, you no. couldn't, you, when I was a kid in the 80s, great decade, but you could not learn computers without going to the beginners, all-purpose, systematic, introductory code. BASIC. Run, stop. The whole bit. So, love those REM statements. You could put all kinds of insults to your teacher in there, or to your friends and things like that. But you wouldn't want to touch basic today. I can understand that completely. Right. It would take you about 300 times longer to write anything than it does. Precisely. Now. But so. the person who took the first step was a Catholic nun. She basically made the first type of computer language that the average person would be able to read, that a 14-year-old like me at the time was able to start programming with. Okay. on his Commodore 64 computer, 64K memory. Bill Gates said no one's going to need more than 128K. Why would they need that? Still remember that thought. Okay. And the list goes on and on. Well, what does the church herself say about science and faith and the role of both? John Paul II in Fides et Ratio, faith and reason. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. That God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth, in a word to know himself, so that knowing and loving God, men and women, may also come to the fullness of truth about themselves. So the church is not against inquiry. There are people who really seriously believe that, that the church is against asking questions. No, you're built to know knowledge. You're built to know yourself. The problem comes when we limit ourselves to this world only you are bound to get a wrong idea of yourself and how you work. Just like a person's going to get a wrong idea of color if they refuse to open their eyes. You will miss out 
on a whole range of things if you insist on only using your ears. Faith, therefore, has no fear of reason, but seeks it out and has trust in it. Just as grace, God's mercy, builds on nature and brings to fulfillment, faith builds upon and perfects reason. Illumined by faith, reason is set free from the fragility and limitations deriving from the disobedience of sin and finds the strength required to rise to the knowledge of the triune God. So look at these people of faith who made such amazing scientific discoveries and propelled us forward in a very short period of time. Science shows us what we can know and what we can do. Authentic religious faith shows us how we ought to use that knowledge and what we ought to do with it. Thank you. And this is the part where I ask you if there's any questions. Okay. Well, that was easy. Thank you. No problem. So coming up in the next month, um, this Sunday we have our stroke survivors.